it is a bit ropey. Mm. CPC's been cut out there. That's exposed connectors. And we've got a green light, we are charging, wow. Good morning and welcome back to a beautiful sunny day here at Artisan Electrics. We're working in this lovely property behind us where we're planning to install battery storage for an existing solar installation that the customers had for about 11 years. And we're gonna talk you through today some of the considerations when it comes to planning a battery storage install. I'm here with my boy John, he's doing an EICR on this property because before we do any major alterations, we wanna make sure that the existing installation is safe to connect to. So we're doing the EICR, we're looking at the solar install that they've got here and we're gonna to plan to put a big bank of batteries to harness that solar energy so that they can run their house off of it at night. Hope you enjoyed this video. Make sure you hit a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And let's get into it. Here at Artisan, our lovely viewers know exactly what we like. The cups of tea are already here and they've given us some healthy snacks today. I wonder if that's because I'm here and not Corey. Usually it's Pringles if Corey's here, but I think our viewers are learning that I prefer the healthy options. Nice cup of tea. So let me illustrate the setup that we're gonna have here on a smaller scale with this EcoFlow battery. So this is a solar panel in a nice little bag. Now why do I have this? Well, let me explain. So solar panels capture sunlight and convert it into electrical energy. And what we're gonna do today with this is actually use these solar panels to store energy into a mini battery and use that battery to run the house while we've got the power turned off so that our customer can still have good Wi-Fi and power any other essential devices that he needs. We've got a portable power station essentially that we're gonna charge up from these solar panels and keep the house running in this situation where we have to turn the power off to do certain tests as part of the EICR. So let me show you how it all works. So this is the EcoFlow Delta Max portable power station. You can charge it up off normal mains 13 amp plug, which we've got here, and it will charge from zero to 80% in an hour, which is amazing. Full charge, 1.6 hours, and it just charges up super fast. I charged this up in the office yesterday. It's a great thing for us to be able to use to provide backup power to our customers when we're doing EICRs or whether we're doing a consumer unit change and we're turning the power off all day. So we're gonna plug these solar panels in and then we're gonna run an extension lead into the house so that we can run all of our customers' appliances from this battery. So now we turn it on and this battery is being powered by these solar panels. Now I did fill it up last night, so all these are gonna be doing is trickle charging into the battery to keep it topped up. But I wanted to use this to illustrate how this system that we're planning on installing in the house will work. So essentially you've got solar panels which are constantly generating solar energy, electricity when the sun is shining. But often during the day, people are out at work, they're not using all of that excess solar energy. So it's getting sold out to the grid. So we're going to install a battery storage system in the house that will allow them to harness that solar energy, charge the battery up during the day with any excess solar, and then in the evening when there is no solar energy being generated because the sun's not shining, they can use the energy from that battery to run their house, meaning that they basically don't have to buy much energy from the grid at all because they can run their house overnight on the solar energy that's been stored in the batteries. And that is basically a larger version of what we're doing here. We're creating solar electricity, storing it in a battery, and then using that on demand when we need it. So we've got a completely off-grid system here on a miniature scale. So you can see that this battery is charging up at a rate of 104 watts. And so it tells us that it's 99% full at the moment and, and in 19 minutes, it will be fully charged. Obviously, as we start to drain that, uh, the figures will start to change, but it's great to have this screen that tells you the exact state and how quickly it's gonna charge up. And it has a plethora of USB sockets. And then on the other side, you've got four 13 amp equivalent British plug sockets, which we're gonna use now 
to run an extension lead into the house to power the house. So the lamp is now working off our battery, which is being charged by the sunshine. How cool is that? And now we've got the customer's Wi-Fi running and all of their essential electronic devices so they can continue home working without interruption. So I'm just carrying out a uh, Wonder Lead check, checking any class one equipment, just checking this cooker and showing that it's not earthed. We'll be inspecting the switch as part of the, the test anyway, but this is why we carry out this check because uh, nine times out of 10, stuff like this doesn't get checked on any ICR and we always do check them just to make sure they are earthed. So before we do any major works in a property, we always insist on doing an EICR. And some people are like, why do you do that? Why do you need to check the whole house? You're only installing a battery or you're only changing the consumer unit. But this is a classic example of why. Often clients haven't had their electrics checked for, well, since the house was built. And there are faults that go undetected because things work but it doesn't necessarily mean they're safe. And John has just found an absolute corker. So tell us what you found. Yeah, so I've, we might have seen earlier, there was a Wonderly check and I was getting 38 volts to the casing of this cooker. We were hoping for a loose connection here and I've taken it off and all the cables are connected. I've put my R1, R2 link in the board to check if there's continuity. I've got nothing, but the line does go back. If I just use a different CPC, of a different circuit, it shows that the line is continuous. So there's a break. So looking at this, the six mil cable is going up here, and it looks like it's bang on the edge here of this cabinet. So I was wondering whether it had been hit when it was installed. Now I was carrying out an insulation resistance check. We've got greater than 999, it's not touching anything. We're getting no readings. If I touch the fixing screw here, we can see that it's jumped right down to 27 mega ohms. So somewhere there is a contact between the fixing for this cabinet and that live cable. Not enough to draw current to blow the fuse. It suggests to me that that cable has been struck when it was installed. It might have been a case that it blew up when the kitchen fitter installed it, turned the fuse back on, and now we've got a earth cable that's been broken by the drill bit. So we've got no earth here, and then the line is slightly being touched or it's just tracking across. So we'll have to investigate that further when we come back to do the works, but it just shows how important it is to carry out these tests. So this battery has a 2016 watt hour capacity. It's a 2800 watt power bank. In this house, we're gonna be installing a much bigger battery system to store the energy from the solar panels on the roof. But if you're looking for a, a small scale battery backup system for emergencies, this is ideal. We've managed to secure a great discount for you guys. If you'd like to get yourself one of these, you can get 5% off using our special code AE5. And there's a link in the description where you can find out more about this and the solar panels and all the other EcoFlow products. So hopefully I've explained on a miniature scale the principle of what we're gonna try and do in the house. Let me show you the plan for the house now and how this system is gonna work. So we've got the manual here for the solar panels which were installed 11 years ago. And we're gonna use this to gather some information to design the right size battery system for the customer. So this, the current PV array comprises of 17 Moser Bayer 235 watt peak modules connecting one string and they provide 3.99 kilowatts peak of solar power. It's got a Fronius IGTL 3.6 inverter and it is 11 years old but it's still working very very well. The panels have got 25 year warranty and the Fronius inverter has got a 20 year extended warranty on it and it's all working fine. So in the past when the government were really pushing solar, they offered very generous feed-in tariff rates to customers who got solar installed. 
feed-in tariff is basically when you generate electricity with your solar panels you get paid for every kilowatt hour of electricity that you generate and here I believe the customer is getting paid 61p per kilowatt hour for every kilowatt hour of electricity they generate even if they're using that themselves in their house. Now on a day like today they're producing a lot of electricity they're not using much in the house they're exporting loads of electricity out to the grid and that's effectively kind of wasted because he gets paid for it whether he uses it himself or not. So why not store some of that power in a large bank of batteries and then use those batteries to run your house at night when you can't rely on the solar energy that's being produced. But in order to size the battery properly, we need to know how much power the customer is using overnight in general so that we can choose a battery that's not too big, not too small, but just provides enough capacity to run the house overnight and then they can recharge it again the next day using the solar. Normally with these kind of solar PV systems, we would aim for about a 10 year payback. So in other words, the system pays for itself after about 10 years. But this customer, because of the feed-in tariff that they got that was very generous at the time, the system actually paid for itself quite quickly in about six or seven years. So now every year they're generating a significant amount of money from this system and it's actually giving them a return on their investment now, which is quite amazing. And I've got a little graph that I'll just show you up here where you can see the crossover point where it actually paid for itself and now how it's doing in this current era. So I've got the data from the customer now. I'll show you the chart which shows their usage. And basically it's quite interesting when you work out the amount of overnight usage is around the 15 to 20 kilowatt hour mark. So we're looking at a larger size battery that will be able to cover that. And we're thinking about an AC coupled battery, which means that it is fed off its own AC circuit. The AC charges to DC to fill the battery. The reason for that is we could do a DC coupled battery, which would involve changing the inverter to a hybrid inverter but then their feed-in tariff readings would be affected because you'd be charging the battery directly from the solar and not feeding into the consumer unit. And obviously then he'd get less money from what he's generating in terms of solar. So for somebody who's got a high feed-in tariff rate, having an AC coupled battery makes more sense. And in this case, we're probably gonna look at a Solax battery, which is their 5.8 kilowatt hour modules. We could fit three modules to bring us up to around the 16, 17 kilowatt hour mark, which should cover most of their overnight usage. So I'm just measuring up here now to make sure we've got enough space to put it here with enough access for maintenance, enough access and space for um, ventilation and stuff like that. But I think this is gonna be an ideal location and we can change the consumer unit, run a new circuit off there and have everything here nice and easy to access. So this is the existing consumer unit and as you can see it's quite old, there's no RCD protection and it's completely full. We'll probably have to upgrade the consumer unit in order to fit a battery storage system anyway. And we'll probably reconfigure all this, put a nice new big consumer unit in with a surge protection device, RCBOs to protect all the circuits, and just get everything up to scratch to the modern safety standards that are now recommended by the regulations. So I thought just for a joke, We'll see if we can charge the Tesla from this EcoFlow Delta Pro Max battery. <sighs> Let's give it a go. I've got my uh, granny lead or trickle charger lead, whatever you tend to call it. So we'll plug that in there. All right, <laughs> this is gonna be fun. And we've got a green light, we are charging, wow. So we're using 2,300 watts and it is trickle charging my Tesla Model 3, which is amazing. <laughs> um, and we're still at 99%. I imagine that'll drop fairly quickly. But if you think about the wattage of this battery, it should actually charge for about an hour before it's fully flat at 2,300 watts, which is pretty impressive, really. I wonder how many more miles of range that would give me. Let me know in the comments. So we've done a wonder lead test and I was getting no continuity to the screws here. Just gonna go to the back box and I'm getting 50 volts. So there's no earth continuity on this. Now this cable should be fed from the light up there. So if I go and remove that, we'll see if there's a loose connection there. Hmm. I wonder if 
just cut them out. You can see here, CPC's been cut out there, and the CPC's been cut out there. For the incoming one, we've got our earth. The outgoing one has been cut off. So we'll need to try and get some length on that and join them back together to get the continuity back down to that switch. Okay, we're doing it end to end here on one of the rings. We've got no continuity on the lines, nothing on the neutrals. But we have got continuity on the CPCs. There's been quite a few adaptions and there's a whole garage to be fed off of this circuit. If we go end to end on the lines again, on insulation resistance, you can see we are getting quite a low value, which means the cables could be sitting in the back of a box quite close to each other and uh, tracking across. I'm trying to find that, it's gonna be a bit of a nightmare, but I imagine it's where the garage is taken off of the socket in the living room. So I'm gonna drop that one next and see what I can find. Okay, this is what I thought would be the offending socket, but to be honest, all of the cables are connected even though it is a bit ropey. That's the cable that goes off to the garage. So there is a break somewhere else on the ring. So we're gonna to have to stick that down as an FI. We've got a question from Matt Wolford. Best tips for speeding up R1, R2. If you have permission to turn all the electricity off, it's not always convenient or if you're in an empty property. I personally, once I've identified the circuits, will go from the earth onto the buzz bar and then turn all of the MCBs on except for the rings. Now you've got R1 and R2 linked out and you can confirm circuits by turning them on and off rather than keep moving the lead each and every time onto each circuit. But it's not always practical if you can't get permission to turn all of it off for a long period of time. So we've had another one in from Electrician Shropshire. Would you test a board where you cannot isolate all the circuits due to business hours? This is something you should really agree with a client and it's something that will be in your sampling and your limitations of testing. So whatever you have agreed with the client is what you would do. It's not always practical. Some clients will say you can't turn off the fire alarm circuit. You can't turn off an alarm circuit to a certain time. So if you've got a restricted time, so say eight till four and you can't turn those circuits off, you have to explain to the client that you can't do a full test and maybe advise having a shutdown later or on a weekend to get around that. Burke Seal, I think that's how you say it. What brand of tool do you use? In all honesty, I'm not a tool snob. It's whatever's working at the time um, and sometimes whatever's on sale. So I've got Nipex, which hasn't broken yet. CK, which hasn't broken yet. Brit Tool, insulated tools. I normally just use them and abuse them until they give up. Um, I don't particularly have a, a favorite brand, although I'm always open for a freebie. Eco.lec, how long should an EICR take? Uh, the NIC state two to four hours on their official documentation, but it really depends on your limitations, your extent of sampling. So you set a, a percentage with the client as to how much you're going to remove how many circuits there are, the restrictions in the way, is it occupied? There's just so many things. So here at Artisan, as a rule, we normally have at least a day to do an EICR, and that may grow depending on what we find on site. This shower here, there appears to be a fixing screw missing from it, which was hidden behind this. But I've had no idea how to get it off, and I'm at risk of breaking the cover. Also, if you're ever working in the bathroom on a shower, always put the plug in. You will lose a screw. <laughs> so we just had a look at this. There is a circuit label up shower, so we would safely assume it would do the shower. However, this is fed off of the immersion. We've just proved that by switching the uh, spur in the cupboard. It's a power shower, so it doesn't actually draw any load, and it is fused down appropriately there. So. Nothing on the matter with it really, except for the state of in here. It's really, really rusted that screw to the point where it snapped off and some of the control gear as well. Oh, lofts weren't made for a husky gentleman. I think that's our fan there. 12 volts, that's 
Plus exposed connectors. It's an axle. Want one? <laughs> So there's underfloor heating coming off of there, as well as that shower. That looks like it might be going to the underfloor heating. An ensuite, just lashed across the loft. Got this, not fixed. At least there's no basic installation showing. So these inner cores shouldn't be showing basic installation. Uh, it does seem like they some kind of seal around it so it might be fire rated but nearly all down lighters are connected like this usually by builders in a, a non-existent cpc cut out i'm just gonna swing in it <laughs> see okay just got my last uh, test to do so i'm gonna do a global ir on everything in the property i've just got permission to turn off then it's just gonna be a case of doing the finishing off the paperwork Right, that's it for today guys it wasn't as much as we were hoping to to film today but hopefully you got something out of it uh, jordan's disappeared as well so no none of him in the outro and we'll see you again next time